Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Allison Leahy and I'm the community manager at Ning. I'm here with Richard Millington, the founder of Feverbee, an online community consultancy, author of Buzzing Communities, How to Build Better Active Online Communities, and your presenter this hour on the topic of conceptualizing a framework for communities. This is our eighth in a series of community management talks with Richard Millington, who has already shared strategies for generating activity, managing growth, creating content, facilitating member engagement, converting newcomers into active members, and the science behind it all. Today, Richard will talk about the conceptualization phase for building an online community, which is possibly the most important phase. If the concept is off, nothing else you do will matter. Richard notes that many organizations make many common mistakes at this phase. They make the community about their brands, products, or services, as opposed to making the community about their audience and focusing on a strong common interest. So whether you're an old hand at community or a brand new Ning customer looking for some fresh tips, or a community manager who's never even heard of Ning before, this webinar will give you a better understanding of how to create community with clouds and how to create a community that makes an impact. It might even help you avoid some of the many mistakes and pitfalls organizations make when building online community. In order to avoid some of those mistakes, Richard will be covering topics like identifying your target audience, determining the type of community, creating the purpose of the community, and deciding what will happen in the community. As questions arise throughout this webinar, please submit them using the questions feature in GoToWebinar or via Twitter using the hashtag NingTalk. You can submit as many as you like and we'll take some time at the end to respond to as many as we can. I definitely invite you to join the conversation over on Twitter with that hashtag NingTalk. And uh, just so you all know, if you have to miss part of this webinar or just want to revisit it at a later date, uh, Richard's presentation will be recorded and I'll be sending a link out to the recording in a follow-up email later today. It will also be available at the Ning blog, cultivate.ning.com, along with other all of Richard's other great talks. All right, so I'd like to give a warm welcome to any Ning customers in the audience and a hearty hello to all you community-loving folks out there. Thank you so much for carving a little time out of your day to be with us. And without further ado, I'd like to Turn it over to Richard Millington. Thanks for that very kind uh, introduction. So about three or four years ago, we began researching a wide variety of different types of online communities to find why some communities succeed and why some communities fail. And we looked at a range of different factors. We looked at what the community manager does. We looked at what platform they use. And we looked at a really wide range of different things. And what we found is that generally, what the community manager did didn't really determine as much as whether the community would be a success. So obviously, there were some glaring examples of community managers that were incredibly active, and their communities were a thriving success, and community managers that did almost nothing in their communities, and their communities failed. But then there were also examples of community managers that were doing nearly everything right and the community still wasn't taken off. They were doing everything that we would typically recommend a community manager do and it still wasn't working for them. And when we began researching this and found that we couldn't really isolate any one specific thing, we looked at a broader, different, uh, well, a much broader array of um, things that could affect whether the community was a, was a success. And the thing that stood out more than anything else was the concept itself. More than anything else, the thing that seemed to determine whether a community was most likely to succeed was whether the actual concept, whether the community was about something that people had an incredibly high or strong level of interest in, whether that was strong enough. That was, that's what determined whether the community was most likely to succeed. And if you get the community concept wrong, as we just heard, nothing else you do matters. Nobody would join a community unless the concept is very closely related to what they do. And this isn't something that we're making up. What we don't realize is that most online communities are ghost towns. In most online communities, there are very few people that are participating. Most online communities, and there's real data to support this, 
most online communities have very few active members. There's a study in the Wall Street Journal back in 2008 by uh, Deloitte, I believe, and they looked at, I think it was around 100 different types of online communities, a random sample of different communities. And what they found, found is that 35% of branded online communities had less than 100 active members. And what they also found is that, I think it was around 75% had a community that really didn't look to be successful at all. And we did our own research to support this as well. Recently, uh, we looked at the brandrepublic.com site, which is generally a marketing site where companies, when they launch an online community, can make a big announcement and a press release and get some attention. And there's around, I think, 850 or so online communities uh, that are being mentioned in this site. And when we looked at these communities, the communities that are being launched around a year or more ago, what we found is that nearly every online community that has ever been mentioned on this site has failed. And this is a pretty random sample of branded online communities here. What we found is that from the 875 communities that were mentioned on this site, only 12 had 100 plus active members. Which means it's only 1.3%, 1.3% of online communities, branded online communities at least, that were successful. Now this number is naturally higher for people that are building communities for their hobbies and aren't related to brands, but it's still not high enough. And what we want to do during this webinar is identify why so many communities fail. Why do so many online communities get the concept wrong? Too many organizations right now are making the same mistakes. And these are mistakes that are very easy to fix. And if you get the concept wrong, what you'll find is that everything you do from now on is going to be incredibly difficult. What you're going to find is that it's always going to be fe feeling like that you're pushing uphill. And it's always going to feel like that your community is not taking off no matter what you do. But we want to resolve that. We want to put in place a concept that does work. Here are some examples of bad community concepts. So for example, Generation Bends which is a community I use very often because it's such a bad example of what to do. Generation Ben is launched an online community for people that couldn't buy their cars today, but might want to buy their cars in the future for future Mercedes-Benz owners. And naturally it failed. British Airways spent over 1 million US on this online community for people that often travel between London and New York. It's a terrible idea for a community. And so naturally it failed. Virgin Media Pioneers sounded like it's a good idea for a community. It's an online community for young entrepreneurs in the UK. But what actually happened is that the concept was so bad, there's nothing unique about it, and it didn't really identify what their audience wanted. Worse still, if you wanted to participate in this community, you have to record a video of yourself speaking, submit that video, and then wait for other people to submit their videos in response. There's a lot of really terrible online community concepts out there. The sad thing is, or perhaps the happy thing is, that we don't see them. There's an incredible success bias. We only see the communities that succeed. What we don't know is that for every online community that succeeds, for every online community that we've heard of, for every Reddit or Facebook or whatever, there are hundreds, possibly thousands of online communities that have failed, that you've never heard of, whose links have been removed, but what we want to establish today is that if you get that concept right, if you get that concept, what the community is going to be about, who is it going to be for, if you make those key decisions using data in the right way, you will launch an online community that will naturally explode. A good example of this is Facebook. So if you look at when Facebook launched, it was a community solely for people at Harvard University. And in fact, they launched from a mailing list of the most popular people, or the people in the, um, in the special clubs, in special membership clubs at Harvard University. They had such a tiny target audience when they launched that community, but it was perfect at the right time, at the right thing. It was perfect for this audience. And there are many online communities that have exploded, perhaps by luck at times, but simply because they get that concept right, and it instantly catches on like wildfire. And we're gonna tell you how to do that now. One of the things you can also do if you go through this webinar is that if you have a struggling community today, you can relaunch it, or perhaps as we can say, reinvent it, 
through this same process. So the process we're talking about is what we call conceptualization, which is a process which we typically think takes about a month to do if you're going to do it well. But what you do if you go through this phase is that you go through a lot of research and you answer all the key decisions that you have to make. So for example, you should not be making your community about you. You should be making the community about something else. So it's going to be more interesting. Very few organizations should have a community about themselves. But if you do your research, then you know this. So don't skip this stage. If you get this right, your community will succeed so much more quickly. And I know the temptation is always going to be to dive in as soon as possible. Don't do that. Make sure that you do the research before you launch your community, because then your community is far, far more likely to, to, to succeed. This is a data-driven process. When you launch your community, the concept should be very narrow, should be very refined, and it should be focused upon catering to the intense needs of a relatively small group of individuals. So we need to answer five specific questions here. One is what will the community be about? Two is who are we going to approach? Three is what type of community will this be? And there are many different types. Four is what is the purpose of this community? And finally, what will happen in the community? So what we use for our clients is a matrix that looks a little bit like this. Now you don't have to write all this down, you can catch up on, on the recording and we're going to go through each question one by one. But what you'll see here is that there's a data-driven process for making this decision. So let's begin with what will your community be about. This decision is typically much harder than what you think. So for example, your organization or you might work in the communication sector. But that doesn't mean that your community has to be about the communication sector. It can be about a specific technology or issue within that sector. It can focus on the, on the needs or a specific challenge or an issue that people have. Or you might make it about a specific group of people within that sector. But don't, with very few exceptions here, don't make the community about your company. That's usually a really boring idea for a community. And worse still, it restricts the members that can join to solely your customers or the people who you, you, who you already have some contact with. So when we're trying to answer this question, we, we, look, we use what we call the MTER framework. So the, your community should be about something you spend a lot of money on, something you spend a lot of time on, something that's emotionally provocative, or something that, rep that represents our identity in some way. And what you'll find is that there are some topics that are far more popular than others, depending upon where they fall within this framework. So Mumsnet, for an example, is a community about parents who are based in the UK. And it's an excellent community for them. It's, it caters exactly to what people are interested in. It caters to the identity element of being a parent. Cancer Connection, uh, one of our clients in, in Canada, has a thriving online community for people that are affected by cancer in their area. Notice what they've done here. It's not just a community for people that are affected by cancer, but they've also done it by location as well. They've focused that interest on a more specific group of individuals. You also find there are lots of communities about things like cars. Because we spend a lot, a, lot, a lot of money on cars. Cars are representative in many situations of our identity. Video games as well. We spend a lot of time on video games. So we want to participate in communities within that sector. So when you're deciding what sector your community is going to be in, you have to make sure that something's going to be extremely interesting to members. There are some organizations that do a really bad job of this. So when TM Lewin launched a community for their mid-price suits, it didn't, didn't take off because no one wants to participate in a community about mid-price suits. Perhaps suits that we spend a lot of money on, perhaps the top of the range mark, mark, like mark, market suits, then that will work. But for the everyday suits, that's probably not going to succeed. When Air France launched this Lunity community, it's another online community for people that travel. There's nothing unique about it. It didn't have a particular focus, but as, and as a result, the community didn't succeed. So we're using this framework here. Now what you see in the examples here is that this is not a comprehensive list, but it gives you some ideas of topics that we're most interested in. 
So when you launch a community, it should fall within one of these topics. It has to fit within one of these four boxes. If it kind of straddles in the middle and that doesn't work for you. You're usually looking for a niche or a niche, as you say in the USA, within a niche or niche. So you have to analyze your members' passions and the interest to get this information. This usually means going out there and talking to your members. Find out what they spend most of their time doing. Finding out what they're most interested in. So in the expensive box here, we have technology. There are lots of communities around technology, around property and investments and things like that. In time, communities that are based around our careers or our hobbies or multimedia are far more likely to, to succeed. And then there are a lot of communities based around things that provoke a strong emotional reaction. So politics and nonprofits and sports teams and religion. And finally, there's the, re the representative. Things that are representative of who we feel we are. So fashion tends to fill in here, sexuality, health, uh, things that are prestigious in some way, and a variety of other cultural groups. So your community, the topic that you're going to build your community in, should fit within one of these four boxes here. And the more hardcore, or the more extreme it fits within that topic, then the more likely that it is going, going to succeed. But again, don't make the community about your organization. Make it about something that members spend a lot of money on, a lot of time on, something that provokes a strong emotional reaction, or something that is representative of our identity in some way. Your community should be able to fit into one of these four boxes here. Which also means that you very often need to reposition the interests. So if you're building a community around, say, washing machines, it's going to be very hard to find people that want to spend their spare time talking about washing machines. But what if you built a community around a specific ben benefit that was related to washing machines? So what about a community for people that wanted to spend as little time as possible doing household chores? Or what if you made it even more, fo even more focused than that? A community for young professionals that want to spend a little time, as little time as possible doing household chores. So, so we're looking for advice and to trade tips that would help them spend as little time as possible or free up their life to do more interesting and relevant things. Or what if instead you build a community around the audience or the niche? So what if you made a community for, um, for say, mums that, for say, stay-at-home mums that um, often do the washing? What if you made it about their lives and not just about washing? Or what if you let them exchange tips on a wide variety of other things? What if you cultivated the brand? What if the washing machine itself was kind of the way we think of innocent drinks in um, the UK or JetBlue in the, in the USA? There's a great book by Douglas Aiken called uh, The Coating of the Brand, which I recommend here. And the final thing you can do is team up with other communities that are out there. So when Amer American Express wanted to reach uh, frequent travelers with a new range of credit cards, what they did is approach an existing online community and created an exclusive place within that community solely for that sort of audience. So there's a wide variety of things you can do if your community doesn't fit within one of those four boxes we just covered to make it fit into one of those four boxes. Another good example is from uh, Homebase. So Homebase didn't just launch a community about gardening. It didn't launch a community about their products or their services. What they did instead was launch a community about DIY gardening, launch a community for people that were getting into gar gardening for the first time. It's a very powerful concept that attracted a lot of people that were intimidated from other types of online communities that are out there. Element 14, or the newer group, um, didn't just launch a community about their products or their services. What they did instead was launch a community for design engineers, the people that use their products and service. They made it about those engineers and providing advice. And it sounds like really obvious stuff, but it's amazing how often organizations get this wrong. So the next thing we have to decide is who are you going to approach? You want to target as homogenous a group of people as possible. You want people that feel they have a lot in common with other people that are in the community. This usually means you have to use what we call two Two, two qualifiers. So a community of people that do something who also do something else. And these qualifiers are typically based around demographics like age, gender, location, profession, 
the habits of what we do, jobs, hobbies, and activities, or what we call psychographics, our opinions, our likes, our dislikes, and aspirations, and the issues that we face. If you know these three things, then you can target a very narrow group of people that have a lot in common with each other. So for example, a community for teenage girls that are shy about asking sexual questions. This is what Girlspace created, this is what, Co what Cotex created with Girlspace. Or a community for backpackers who want to reduce the weight of their backpacks. This is what Backpacking Life did. Or a community for those affected by cancer that live in Canada. So like cancer connection. Or community, and one of my favorite ones, and, and an incline, so I recommend you check them out. So a community for those that love rock and roll and are middle-aged, rockandrolltribe.com. Or community for activist parents that live in the UK, mumsnet.com. But you notice that each of these is based upon the demographic, what they are, a characteristic of the audience itself, a habit, so something that that audience does, or a, or a psychographic, something that they think or feel or, or they want. You really do need to be focusing on as narrow a group as uh, a narrow group of people as possible, and you need to analyze your audience to decide this. You want to identify a cluster of people within that broader topic, who, by their demographics, their habits, and their side, and then the psychographics, have a lot in common with each other. So that means you have to survey them, that means you have to interview them, you have to literally go out there and find 10, 25, perhaps 50 people you can speak to and get this information. Because this is the information that's going to help you craft a very, very specific community concept. So an example of the girls based community here, a community that really worked because it was a great place for the, the audience that they were trying to reach or backpacking light here, you see a thriving online community where people can exchange advice about getting as light a backpack as possible. Or Rock and Roll Tribe I use as an example all the time. Again, it's a thriving online community because they know exactly who they're catering towards. So you want to start with a very narrow focus and expand gradually. So what we mean by this is that when you launch a community, you often need to hold back on targeting everyone that, that you want to reach, just to get the community off the ground. Just to get that community off the ground, you have to focus on as few people as possible. Remember that, that, that Facebook, when it launched, it was just for one university, a specific group of, pe of people at one university. And it wasn't until two years later, possibly longer, that they let anyone join. For a long time, it was a closed, very private on online community. So what your community is when it launches might not be what it still is a year later, but to just get that community off the ground, you have to, fo to focus on a narrow group as possible and cater to what they want. The next question we have to answer is what type of community will it be? So there are five types of online communities. There's a community of place, which is generally a community based around a specific geography geographic location, a community of practice, for people that participate in the same activity together, there's a community of action, people that want to change something in the world, a community of, so, of circumstance, people that face similar situations, so most um, health-based communities are in this uh, category, and finally a community of interest. You have um, a lot of, of hybrids here too. So for example, a community of place and, and practice, a community of action and practice, place and circumstance, and you can find a wide variety of communities that fit into these categories. And hybrids are even better because they focus more specifically on what your members want. Remember, you want to build the only community of its kind. When you launch your community, you should have no real competition. So for example, if you are building a community for, say, accountants, this typically would be a community of practice. But if there are already existing communities there in, within that category, then you'd be crazy to go up against an existing established online community. What you might want to do instead is build a community for, for accountants that live in a particular location, or a community of, of, of accountants that 
want to change something about the profession, make it a community of action, or a community for accountants that face a similar challenge that they want to resolve, make it a community of circumstance, or perhaps just a community of accountants that like to play golf or are interested in how social technology is, is, a change, is changing the field. So you can take any topic and usually make it fit into any type of community you want. Don't go with the default community of interest. Most organizations, when they launch a community, they make it a community of interest. But a community of interest is actually the hardest type of online community to create. It's the one that's most likely to have the most competition. You're far more likely to, to succeed by not going head to head with that existing community that are out there, and instead making your community something that's more specific, community of practice and interest, or action and interest. There are so many successful hybrid communities that are out there that there's no reason you have to compete head to head with any existing established online community. This means that you have to review the existing community ecosystem, as we call it. So for your topic, how many online communities, how many meetup groups, how many forums, and other types of competition are out there? You can ask the existing target audience, if you like, what types of communities they've heard of and what types of communities they participate in. You can find out how popular these communities are, what percentage of the people you interview actually mention them. And if they're popular, then don't compete against them. Create a community that is completely unique. Make sure that your community is the only community of its kind. So for example, on the left, we have the American College of Cardiology. They didn't launch another online community of, for, 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 for doctors, because there's too many communities like that. Like that. You have doctors.net, you have Sermo, you have so many other types of communities. What they did instead was launch a community of action, specifically to reduce patient waiting times. Likewise, um, the founders of studentdoctor.net didn't launch another doctor community, they launched a community for doctors that were also students. If they identified an underserved, an underserved, an underserved cluster of people and built a thriving online community just for them. And this community, by the way, has over 13 million posts. It's a thriving online community. If you get the concept right, your community can completely take, take off straight away. Likewise, with Backpack and Lay, this isn't another travel community. That's a very popular and very competitive field. Instead, it's, it's, a, it's a community for backpackers that want to reduce the weight of their bags. When they looked at their audience, they analyzed that this is exactly what their audience wants. And now, because their concept is so perfect and they have absolutely no competition, they charge money to join and participate in this community. So your community should be the only community of its kind. Next, we want to work out what the purpose of the community is. So every community should have a goal, even if it's not the most explicit goal that's out there. And that goal should usually be one of the following. First, it should make members happier, healthier, or wealthier in some way. A community that helps members achieve these things tends to attract a lot, a lot of members to join. Second, it should resolve an issue that members have. If it's not going to be a community that makes members happier, healthier, or wealthier, you should resolve an issue that they had, or reduce a fear, or prevent something bad from happening. Or finally, it should be something that helps members achieve their aspirations. So for example, a film community can be a place where members get the latest film news first. It can be a place for the most analytical film reviews. It can be a place where, you, where all the top film critics uh, participate. It can be the most fun place to discuss films. Any community can have many different goals. And the goals you share and the goals you set should be based upon what your members want. And the only way you can identify what your members want is, again, going out there and asking them about their hopes, their aspirations, the, ch the ch challenges they face, the risks that they have, uh, the fears that they have, what keeps them up at night. Because when you start asking members this, what you'll find are clusters of answers that are very similar to each other. And you can use that as a goal of your community. So a health-based community can be the best source of emotional support. It can be a place where people get the most practical information. It can help people be healthier. It can help people find others in their local situation or in, or in, their, lo or in their low locality. 
Likewise, a business community can be the best source of best practices, it can be the best source of finding out what's new, it can be the most fun, it can have the best experts showing the best expertise. This again isn't a comprehensive list, but the goal of your community is going to be incredibly important. And you should be making sure that your community or that the members in your community benefit from participating in that community. And that benefit should be linked to participation. It should be linked to something the members have to do to achieve. Members shouldn't be able to go to your community and get everything that they need without participating. If you do that, you're going to find that you have a community with a lot of, of lurkers. So ask your prospective members about their hopes, their challenges, and their aspirations. And you'll use that data to find out what your community is going to be about. And finally, and we've covered this a lot in the previous webinar, so I'm not going to go that deep into it now. Finally, you will decide what will happen in the community. And in fact, in many cases, this isn't a decision that you make right here. Your research will tell you what will happen in that community. So you, you, you do this by looking at what type of community you're, you're developing and what your audience already does. So the type of community you create changes everything that happens in that community. So if I go back to that slide. So if you're developing a community of place, this is going to be a community orientated around local meetups, lo local issues and discussions and things like that. A community of, of practice is going to be a community where most of the discussions and activities is based around what's new or what is proven to work or things are based around that field. A community of action is going to be based around milestones and what members can do to help achieve the next milestone. A community of circumstance is going to be orientated around bonding related discussions where members can get to know each other and share their expertise and feel quite comfortable. And a community of interest is going to be people discussing typically how much they love their interests and proving how much they are involved and understanding of that topic. So what type of community you create very much changes what will happen in that community. But in addition to this, you want to know what members are already doing. What you don't want to do is guess what's going to work in your community. Instead of guessing, you can find out exactly what works. So for example, if you go to, um, actually let me think of a better example. If you attend meetup groups or search for that topic on t Twitter or participate in other communities, what are your prospective members already doing? So let's imagine you go to a meetup group and you find that the people there spend a lot of time discussing what equipment they use. It would make sense to create a place for that in your community where members can list their equipment, ask questions about their equipment, review different types of equipment. You might have a top 10 list or a community endorsed um, list that, that works for, you, for your members. What you might also find is that members often discuss things outside of that interest. And if they do that, you can find out what they're discussing outside of that interest and then create a place for that within the community. So for example, um, I remember a HR professional saying that whenever they go to a meetup of HR professionals, the, the, hey, the HR professionals are always sharing their funniest stories about what they've had to deal with in their line of work. So it makes sense then if you're running a HR community to create a place within your community, a forum category or a feature or a discussion where members can share their funniest story of the week or of the month or the year or of all time. You can, you can look to see what members are already doing and bring that into your community because then you know this is going to work and you don't have to guess. You also want to be encouraging and facilitating events, content and discussions around what topics always come up in these other types of places. So common things that tend to come up a lot here, especially if you go to any of these meetups at all, is that people do typically spend a lot of time discussing the equipment that, that they use or things that they need to participate in their um, interest. They often talk about other, other people, um, Gossip places within a community have proven quite popular in the past. Sharing pictures has become quite quite popular. If, if your topic is relevant to that, there's very often if you go to these events where people are just like to complain about things or comfort each other about things, 
again, you can create places for this within your community. You can be sure that when people come to your community, they're going to want to participate in these things because they already do. So by now, this is what you, you should know. This is what you should be able to do. You should know is the topic that you're building your community within is engaging enough for that community to succeed. We know, for, the, for example, there are very few successful communities based around commodity products. Because we don't spend a lot of time on these. We don't spend a lot of money on these. These aren't emotionally representative of our identity in some way. And they aren't in any way provoke a strong emotional reaction from us. Second, you should know exactly who you're going to approach, or perhaps more importantly, you know who you're not going to approach. So you've looked at your audience and you've deliberately cut out large groups of individuals to cater to a single cluster that you can cater towards. So if you're building a community for a very narrow group of people, you can initiate discussions specifically for that group. You can create content specifically for that group. You can have events and activities specifically for that group. And that means everyone in that group is most likely to join it. So for example, if you were to launch a new community of, te of teachers, that might not be that successful because there's so many existing established online communities like now, um, like that now. So like Teachers Connect and all the communities like that. But if you were to say launch a community for maths teachers that live in Boston, I'm going to bet that every maths teacher that lives in Boston is going to join that community. Third, you should know exactly what type of community you will create and why it matters what type of community you're creating. So if you're, community, if you're creating a community of practice where members are discussing what's new or what's proven to work, then that's going to be a very different type of community from a community of action which is trying to change something in the world. You should know that your community should be the only community of its kind. Next, you should know what the goal of the community is. The goal is what's going to attract a lot of people to join and participate in your community. You should know what the specific appeal is to get members to join a community. And again, this isn't this is something where you guess. You ask your members what they most want, and then you create a community based around that. And this, this is a community that's going to help people be happier, healthier, wealthier. It's going to reduce the, the risk of something bad happening or resolve fears that uh, these people have. Finally, you should know what's going to happen in your community. You should know what content, discussions, and events that you're, you're, you're going to create, because these are the types of content, discussions, and events that are already successful and popular with your target audience. If you do this, and if you do it right, you should launch a community that just naturally takes off. All you have to do is make sure that your members hear about that community, and they'll join and they'll participate and it'll be incredibly successful. If your community is struggling right now, if it's not getting off the ground, then you need to reinvent your community based around this. That usually means you need to narrow the focus of that community to target a more specific group of, in, of, in, of individuals and then expand later on. Okay, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you again. Um, I do hope that you're willing to do one thing right now, which is download half of my book for free, which you can do at www.feedbee.com slash ning.html. Please don't forget the uh, HTML. And if you download that book today, I uh, will send out um, some documents and some information that go into more detail on what we discussed today. And you also get a free ebook as well, um, The Proven Path, about how to start an online community. And if you're interested as well, then we have a community, a community management course where we teach people how to build thriving communities. We've had some terrific people take this course from Oracle, Amazon, Lego, patients like me, a wide variety of incredible um, and terrific community managers have taken this course. And you can find that at um, course.feedb.com. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. If you have any questions, then use the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Alison, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Richard. And I can't uh, recommend the Feverbee Community Management course 
uh, enough. So definitely go ahead and check out that landing page. Richard has got some great resources there as well. And of course, Buzzing Communities is not to be missed. We do have a few questions here to get us started. And I hope um, some of you out there are thinking up some other questions you'd like um, you'd like Richard to answer. Um, we'll start with one from Eileen. And Eileen's, um, let's see. So Eileen says, you've mentioned before that support communities are the exception to the community rule. People jump in, get a problem solved, and jump out. Can a support community morph into a bigger community that includes support, but that becomes just one part of the picture? Uh, yes, it can. The challenge with um, support communities, and not support communities as in um, health-based communities, but more customer service-based communities, is that they're not generally communities at all by the definition of people that continue participating in that community, build relationships, get to know each other. People go there, they ask a question, and then they leave. But there are organizations like um, giftgaff.com who have done an incredible job of building a community that does provide that support, but also provides a wide array of, uh, of, of other things. So the way of doing that is to start expanding gradually, start introducing and, gu and, gui and guiding their discussions. So you can have that support community and then create an entirely new place for, some, for something else, perhaps a new group or form or whatever. But more, what you might want to do is start initiating dis uh, discussions that aren't support based and see how popular they are. Start initiating discussions, ask members for their opinions on different issues, ask mem asking members about their experiences, um, and really getting to see what types of discussions are most successful and then building upon that. And you can also use your influence here to make those types of discussions as uh, sticky threads or bump them up or get more people participating in those types of discussions and subtly influence the direction of, the, of that community. It won't always work. Um, customer service based communities are kind of tr tricky at times. Members have their habit of going there only when they have an issue. But you can do it gently and check if it's going to succeed and then build upon it, and build upon it, upon it from there. Thanks. That's a great response. And um, it's something we're actually going to be trying with our creators community. So that will be an interesting one to watch over the next few months. Uh, we'll be taking it slow at first, as Richard suggested, but we're definitely going to try to refocus from just a Ning support based community to one that's infused with more community management tips and trending topics and discussions of that nature. Um, and when we open it up to the broader community, uh, anyone on this list, you know, we'll be talking about it more and more, and you'll all be invited to join us over there and keep the discussions alive. Um, so this next question comes from Mark. Mark wonders why the communities mentioned, such as the future Mercedes owners, um, are inherently a bad idea. I know you discussed a bit about how product-based or um, communities don't provoke that strong emotional reaction, but are there any other reasons um, that those communities have failed or that they're necessarily uh, not such a great idea? Sure, so let's take a look at the um, Generation Benz community. I think it might still be alive, uh, generationbenz.com. If you look at that community con concept, it's a community for people that aren't customers yet, that might be customers in the future. Now, if you go to any audience, and I'm, and I'm going to guess here, and if you ask them if they want to participate in a community about a product that they can't purchase, I'm going to bet that they say no. People don't want to spend their spare time doing this. And remember that our spare time is the most valuable thing that we can give here. So a concept like that doesn't succeed because members just don't want to participate in a community for something that they can't do. So the concept itself is very bad. If they did the if they if they did the research beforehand, they would have found that. Um, what was the other example we had? Um, Metro Twin. So Metro Twin was a community by British Airways for travellers that often flew between London and New York. People that were there that were very busy. So the concept was that members would share their tips where if you liked um, this place in London, you'll love that place 
in, in New York, or if you love that place in New York, you should go to this place in London. It's a comparative-based community. So that sounds like a community that would make sense, but in, in practice, it just didn't pay take off at all. I wanted to bet if they had done their research beforehand and found out if the audience, A, had the time to participate in the community, or if they saw the community as quite a frivolous thing, they would have found that there was a more pressing need for this audience, an audience that often flies between London and, and New York, than just sharing tips. Now, I don't know what that would be, but I'm betting that it wasn't just comparing, it wasn't just comparing different locations in that city. And remember, when you start doing that, you start competing against uh, Tri uh, TripAdvisor and all the other sites that are out there now. If you look instead what um, what the American Express did with uh, Flyer Talk, so they're reaching pretty much the same audience, business travelers, but they're doing it by creating a, an exclusive place within an existing travel community. So members feel like they're part of an, an, an exclusive group, so it becomes part of their identity. They're making the community a representative part of who they are. And, and I hope this makes sense. So members are more inclined to join that community to, to discuss um, a whole wide array of, of different things related to who they are, rather than just sharing tips. And that makes more sense if you do the research first, and you identify that this community probably didn't have much of a chance of succeeding. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, a couple questions about activity here. Uh, let's. Sorry, just locating that one. Um, so Matt wonders, how do you define active membership, and what is an acceptable level of engagement? Is it subjective? Is there a quality versus quantity? Um, type of statement or issue involved? It's an incredibly subjective thing. Um, so we personally classify active members as someone that's made a contribution within the last 30 days. And that's a relatively arbitrary amount, but you have to draw the line some, sort of somewhere, and, uh, and we draw it there. Um, and how many members should you have in the community? So this varies very much by the number of online communities, by, by the um, type of community that's going to be. So when um, Oprah launched her Oprah Conversations community, um, and it had like 16,000 people that were participating in that community, that sounds like an incredible success. But when you think that her audience is millions and millions, that's not that many people in hindsight. Whereas alternatively, if you have, say, the top 100 people in the world for that pro for a single pro uh, profession participating in a highly exclusive um, on on online community, then you're going to deem that as success. So it's incredibly subjective and very much to term um, uh, based upon what type of community you're you're creating, how big the, the total audience is, and also how ex how um, how exclusive you want the community to be. Great, thank you. And to kind of build upon that, Blake is wondering if um, how you figure out when your community has reached critical mass. Is that equally subjective? Is it still a pen and paper math task? So what happens when you launch an online community is that initially you will be doing pretty much everything. So you'll be initiating all of the discussions, you'll be creating all, all of the content, you'll be organizing all of the events, you'll be inviting people to join that community and participate in that community, you'll be prompting people to participate in particular dis, uh, di, uh, discussions, or at least you should be. But what you'll find is that over a period of time is that members start to do this on their own. They get into the habit of visiting that community and participating and coming back to see what's new. So the critical mass point, as we define it, is a point when more than 50% of growth and activity in that community is coming by the community itself and not from you. So you're still doing the same amount of work, but now most of the activity and most of the people that join the community aren't invited by you, and the discussions aren't being initiated by you, but they're being initiated by, by, by the community. And that's what critical mass is, where more than 50% of the community can um, can 
um, continue initiating that activity, so you don't continue doing ev ev everything yourself. If you, if you launched your community, say, three to six months ago, and you haven't got to that stage, then you probably need a new community concept. Okay. And back onto the uh, community concept question, we're getting quite a few questions about how narrow is too narrow of a concept. I'd imagine creating a community for entomologists in San Francisco who love ice cream might be a bit too narrow, but how do you know if, if your concept might be in that vein, just too narrow to gain traction? I'm not sure you can have a too narrow a concept. Um, you can have a concept that's irrelevant. So um, the profession in San Francisco that like ice cream might be a bit too extreme, unless there's a lot of people that like I that like um, ice cream within that profession. In which case, it's a perfect on online community for them, and everyone that likes um, I, uh, I, I ice cream within that profession in San Francisco is going to join that community, and that community will get off the ground really quickly. And once it gets off the ground, then you can expand it to people that also like, say, muffins or also like cookies or sweets or whatever. And you can gradually expand it, and then you can expand it to different low, low locations. This is why Facebook is such a terrific example here. It's a community that launched at just one university for one specific group of individuals. They're talking like an audience of a few hundred people when they first launched that community and they gradually expanded and expanded from there. And you find that lots of communities do very similar things. They launch with a very narrow focus, and then expand gradually from there, because the point of launching with a, narrow, with a very narrow fo and focus is to make it as easy as possible to get that community off the ground. Because once there are already people participating in that community, it's far easier to get other types of people to participate in, in that community. So what your community is when you launch is probably not what's going to be like, say, a year, a year later or two years later. But to just get that community off the ground, which is the hardest thing to do, then it helps have a focus that's as narrow as possible. So two qualifiers is good, three is better. Um, any more than that, you might find it a bit difficult. If, you, if your total audience is, say, 10, pe 10 people, then perhaps that, uh, that, that's not going to work. Or perhaps it will if these are the top scientists in the world that want to debate one particular issue in, 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 uh, in depth. So I wish there was a definitive answer here, but I don't think you can have too, 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 too narrow, just a community that is too ir ir uh, irrelevant. There are some long lines for ice cream around here, just saying. <laughs> Uh, but that's a great point. You can always expand. Um, let's see. So we've got a question from Matthew here. Um, he's wondering specifically what are these stats you got back on how many people did or didn't have a community strategy? I think maybe in reference to some of the studies at the beginning of the presentation, or if you could just uh, speak to that topic in abstract if necessary. Yeah, the strategy question was really difficult because, <laughs> as weird as it sounds, everyone has a different definition of what a strategy is. And I think what, what, what we found, this was a couple of, year, of years ago now, is that it didn't really matter if community managers had a strategy or not because pretty much no community manager that we spoke to stuck to the, to, to the strategy. So there were some community managers that would spend a long time writing a long, detailed strategy of containing everything that they were planning to do, but they would never actually execute upon that. So we didn't look at strategies so much. We looked at what the community manager was actually doing, um, what types of discussions they, they were initiating, um, what types of events they, 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 they were facilitating, how, how often they personally were, were participating. Again, what we found is that there wasn't really one significant thing that made a difference. Um, aside from doing absolutely nothing and doing a lot. So you, you can still do a lot and fail, and you can still do relatively nothing and, 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 and succeed if you get the concept right. 
Very interesting. I think I'm definitely one of those people, hopefully I'm not alone, that, you know, creates and defines a strategy, but can have some difficulty sticking to it. I guess that's when you have to scale it back and redefine uh, what you're actually going to accomplish within the community and create realistic goals there. This question comes from Cameron. How do you approach conceptualizing a community for an organization to share knowledge? Do you still recommend starting with a targeted audience and who? Sure. So we're doing um, some work with the World Bank right now um, on exactly this thing. What we found works best for a knowledge sharing community is to focus not so much on one particular audience, but to focus on one particular um, situation or issue that people want to resolve now. And once you've achieved that, it's much easier to build momentum for the next issue and the next issue, and you start building that social capital, and it becomes much easier to get a community going. So we focus very much upon one issue, perhaps for three to six months, and we try to comprehensively resolve that issue in one particular place. We try and make sure we get all the people that are involved or related to that issue sharing their information in that one particular place, and then we expand gradually from that. Great. And building on that, Cameron wants to know, for a community um, that is based on sharing knowledge, is it possible or preferable to incorporate forums, blogs, and, and a video platform or multiple features in a single community? Uh, this depends so much upon the audience that you're talking about. Um, it varies wildly from community to community. What does tend to work best is when you launch the community, have as few features there as possible, perhaps just a discussion place, um, and then gradually add new features when there's a clear demand for those features. You want to focus the attention in just one place within the community where when you launch, and then gradually add new things in as the community starts to pick up more and more traction. All right, great, thank you. So a couple more, we are approaching um, 10 a.m. here on the West Coast. Um, and I don't wanna keep you all day, although this is a great topic and I know you're all really appreciating Richard's answers. I definitely am. Um, so we've got two more questions then, one from Anka. Anka would like to create a community for religion teachers who use a specific method. Would you recommend she creates a community for the that group of teachers in general, or or those the group of teachers who use that specific method? Um, she mentions she might limit the target group, but would like to give additional information through the community. So the first thing I would say to that is that that um, that wor that wording comes up a lot for community managers that fail. Um, and I don't mean that in as negative a way as, as what it sounds. So with a lot of companies that we spoke to that have a community that hasn't taken off, they would say something like, I wanted to create a community for our audience to do X. But then they never actually checked with their, their audience if they want to do X. They never went out there and spoke to their audience or attended um, meetups or looked on Twitter to see if their members were already doing X. And because they never did that, they had no idea if that topic was going to succeed. You don't generally get to decide what your members are going to do. What you do get to do is to look at what they're already doing, look at what they want to do, and include that within your community. Having said that, um, I would typically say yes to have as, as narrow a focus as possible. So create a community for those teachers that want to use that particular technology. As long as there is a clear, and I mean you've been out there, you've attended those meetups, and you've heard people who are already discussing this uh, uh, elsewhere, otherwise what you're doing is that you have a big risk. Um, so be careful about that. Thank you. And the final question is here from Eileen. How do you find your intended, intended audience? 
Um, it's a big question, but you mentioned, for example, great scientists who want to focus on a specific topic. Yeah, this is a huge question. Um, so we covered this a lot in the uh, growth webinar. What we typically do, um, and it helps generally if you're launching a community, to have already built relationships with the people that, that you want to join the community when you launch. So when we interview our members, uh, the uh, prospective members, these are the people that are going to be the first members, the founding members of that community as well. So it helps, obviously, if, if you already know people that are interested in that topic. If you don't, then I'd be very, ner very ner nervous about launching a community within that topic. What you should do instead is spend time building relationships with people that are up in that field. That means going um, and participating in that activity, perhaps creating a blog on that topic, attending, attending events, um, hosting events, uh, curating content, participating online, and individually reaching out to pe pe people that are in that field by um, LinkedIn or people that mention it on Twitter or Facebook or have attended conferences or have reviewed books on that topic uh, on Amazon or whatever field you want to use and individually reaching out to them and introducing yourself and getting to know them and getting them to a place where they know you and they like you and they want to be involved and they bought into what you're doing. Awesome, great advice. And um, thank you so much for your time, Richard. Thank you everyone for joining us. I will include a link to the recording, but I'll also go ahead and include a link to the archives. And um, you know some of Fever Bee materials here, uh, Richard's Buzzing Communities, which is a must read, and the Fever Bee course, which you should definitely check out as well. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you next time.